Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. It'll be like sucking the marrow out. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> what is that? What is that even? What is that? A th it, how does uh, that possibly relate to movies? You're, you're sucking the. I, I don't know. Sucking the audio out. It's. I don't know. Oh, I yeah. don't know. Well, that's what I. I guess. Okay. It sounded horrible yeah. the way it you said sound, it. It did. It's it sounded horrible. like we're, we're <laughs> plucking the life out of the film. We're gonna do that. We're gonna suck. That's what we do here. <laughs> <laughs> we render it lifeless. If, if if cinema was life was full of life and joy for you, come listen to the next reel. 
<laughs> we will <laughs> we will render it inert. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, now let's move in quickly. I want to execute this and make sure it's efficient. It's efficient kill, execution kill, kill. tonight. It's strategery. We're going to get organized. <laughs> I would like to start, before we do the, the, the who we are and where we are thing, I would just like to say, for the record, that off the record, a number of listeners have come to me and refuse to admit this in public, but they have come to me, and some of them are important, and one of them you know uh, quite well, and they have come to me, and they have said, Pete, I would never admit to this in real life, but I'm telling you now, I absolutely agree with your assertion that Taxi Driver is a snooze fest. <laughs> And I just want to say that out loud, even though I have no on-the-record reportage that I can share, but there are people out there, I am not alone, and I feel in some small way redeemed. So thank you. You know who you are. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, well, my people are watching. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going my to people find are watching, you. And we all have mohawks. What does that tell you? right um we are uh, we're the next reel everybody thank you so much for uh joining me and andy nelson i'm pete wright and we're here we're going to talk about uh, a movie uh continuing our series 1976 great year for movies and uh, so we're going to continue talking about 1976 with the film carrie uh tonight sissy spacek that's sissy right sissy spacek and carrie uh, if you want to learn more about us, head over to thenextreel.com. You can catch up with the blog. You can head over, uh, uh, go to the contact page there, and you'll find all the ways to contact us on Twitter. You can send us email. You can call us. There's a phone number there. Um, it, you know, if you leave us a voicemail, we'll surely uh, share it on the air. Mm -hmm. So make sure you do that. Uh, head over to Facebook, facebook.com slash thenextreel. It's become a great place for... Uh, um, for you know, movie trivia stuff and good, uh, good kind videos that we share that are interesting and lots of nerdery and and so uh, uh, we've got some good stuff going on over on Facebook. Uh, if you do, if you are a regular listener of the show, make sure you uh, you go over to iTunes. Uh, if you're a subscriber for free, you get it every week and uh, leave us a comment and uh, some stars. Uh, it's a really handy way to get other people to uh, discover the show in iTunes. And we just learned. I, I don't know how how I want to pitch this, but we learned or have been made aware mm -hmm. that if you are not in the United States, if you're in another country, we are in the United States. And if you are not in the United States and you leave a comment in your local iTunes store, we, uh, at least as of right now, don't know how to see that comment. So we just appreciate you leaving it because other people in your country will discover the show and listen to it in English. Thank you for listening and joining uh, our little community. And one yeah. day we're going to figure out how to actually read those comments. But uh, it likely won't matter because, uh, you know, you probably speak a language we don't. But you can still send us an email. Let us know that you posted it. We'd love to hear. Yeah, because we can totally Google Translate that all the, live long, right. all the live long day. You're here. Yeah. I think that's all we have, right? Yeah, that was, uh, uh, you know, the... Uh... The gentleman over at uh, AuteurCast uh, pointed that out on their podcast and made me realize that, yeah, that's something we should be paying attention to, too. So, yes. so thanks to them for, for catching that. Indeed. Uh, so what's up tonight? So, uh, okay, so we're going to talk about Carrie. For, we should talk about uh, some trailers. Uh, we should talk about some Facebookery. Uh, I would like to talk about some Facebookery first, uh, some, some of the links we posted. I want to make sure people see some of these links. Go ahead. This week was a this week was a good week for links. It First a, of all, did, it was a busy week. Yes, <laughs> it was a busy week. Did you see? Uh, holy cow! Well, first of all, there was the there's the Star Wars uncut. Oh yeah, and then the Empire uncut. Uh, Very exciting. Did, if, did, have you been through all of the uh, uncut Star Wars? <laughs> I couldn't watch the whole thing, but so I what, did. What, I, what I is enjoyed, it? I enjoyed watching it for about you know a good twenty thirty minutes or so. Basically, it's a fan version of Star Wars where they basically gave like people could sign up for I can't remember how much they got like thirty seconds something. 15, uh, I, I thought they it was got fifteen. To recreate, maybe it's fifteen seconds. I couldn't remember how long it was. They got to recreate a fifteen second chunk of Star Wars however they wanted, 
And then whoever was putting this together compiled them all and created a full-length version of Star Wars that's essentially a fan film with all the fans, uh, different creations put together to create it. Some were animated, some were um, uh, live actions, like stop-motion animation with Legos. Some were done Some were in, wearing pajamas. Some were wearing pajamas. Some were really cool, uh, cool CG. Some were just completely off the wall. It was it was a riot. It was an absolute riot, and I definitely recommend everybody who's a Star Wars fan go check out Star Wars Uncut. And and they did just announce that they're going to be putting together the Empire uh, Strikes Back Uncut project, and uh, that that happened I think today, yesterday. In, in any case, it's uh, apparently crushing their servers right now because there are a lot of fans who would like to contribute their fifteen seconds. Uh, so it's totally worth checking out. The other video that I was I really deeply viscerally amused by uh, was Patton Oswalt's uh, Star Wars filibuster uh, on Parks and Recreation. And this was for an, an episode of uh, Parks and Recreation that uh, I guess is is coming. I, I don't watch the show, um, but uh, I think I, I might based on this kind of <laughs> this kind of humor uh pat oswald is in a uh like i guess it's some sort of a civic meeting and he is he decides to filibuster and his the conversation uh, that he then launches into a nine minute filibuster based on uh the 2015 proposed release of star wars episode eight and he finds a way through this improvisation at the podium to uh, connect Star Wars to the Marvel Universe, the X-Men Universe, and the Fantastic Four Universe. Uh, and uh, as one commenter uh, said, you know, the only thing that would be better is to have Mal and Serenity saving Luke from Wolverine. Uh, but it really is, uh, it's, it's great to watch, and it shows just how, how uh, you know, what a great nerd and what a, a fantastic uh, improvisational speaker Patton Oswalt is. It was great. Absolutely, I have a uh, a buddy who's on a on a, the council for a uh, he's a city council member in in the city of Tempe down here, and he um, he said on Facebook that he wished more people would come and <laughs> and do these sorts of little uh, speeches <laughs> at their council <laughs> meetings just to liven things up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine. I can Absolutely. totally imagine. Absolutely. Uh, so that was there's some good stuff. We also uh, you'll see uh, from this weekend we have our uh, our episode. Uh, we had a film board episode this weekend, the film board event of the month, uh, where we got uh, let's see who'd we have. We had Mike and Steve, uh, Mike Evans, Steve Sarmento joined us, and we talked about Forty Two, the Jackie uh, Jackie Robinson biopic. So go check that out uh, if you are thinking about seeing that movie. Hopefully, our uh, discussion on it helps you make a decision. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so shall we shall we talk trailers? Let's talk trailers a little bit. Let's do it. You want to go first? You want me to go first? Um, I'll go first. Right. Why not? All right. So uh, the trailer I'm talking about this week is Disconnect, which looks like a really fascinating film, and I think it's opened limited in some places around the country. The release date's April 12th, but it's not open anywhere near me. So uh, I'm not quite sure, but it's it looks like a story of a multiple, you know, a group of different people looking at the modern connections that people have and how people are in the case of this film, how a lot of people aren't necessarily using it for good, whether it's, I you know, stealing your identity or bullying a, a kid at school by by sending him face uh, fake uh, fake book posts from a girl that he likes um, to to just, you know, the way that reporters are accessing news and all of this. It looks like a really fascinating story with uh, uh, just a, it that seems to be fitting the times right now. And uh, I, I found it absolutely fascinating and definitely something that looks like something I want to watch. Jason Bateman's in it. Hope Davis, Paula Patton. Alexander Skarsgård. It's got a, a great cast, and uh, it's directed by um, Henry Alex Rubin, who uh, most recently was nominated for an Oscar for the documentary he did, Murderball, which is an absolutely um, amazing documentary. Truly. Really, really great. And so, I don't know, the, the trailer for this film just really stood out for me as something that's definitely worth watching. 
Um, uh, yeah, I'm actually, I, I'm excited about this one. I get nervous about these sort of uh, kind of techno thrillers um, because the, it always makes me think of uh, the net. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm that, sort of that's naturally, a good reason to be nervous. I'm naturally biased. It's that or hackers, you know, like, you know, hacker skateboarders. But you, but uh, I don't think this movie's going down that road. I, I hope think it's, it's not. It's more, yeah. I think it looks like more of a, a drama thriller rather than just a straight up thriller. And uh, you know, there's definitely some elements of you know the the, the uh, identity theft and, and stealing your bank account information, and all that. But I, I don't know. I just think the relationships in this look a lot stronger. And I, I my sense from watching the trailer is it it really has a much uh, better story than any of those sorts of films so i mean i you know don't get me wrong, i'm gonna see it yeah I'm, I'm just saying i'm gonna, be, I'm gonna see it with nerves <laughs> i have to watch my adrenals it's not called the net two at least <laughs> uh my trailer is a uh it's comedy uh this is uh, it's called the way way back uh, and i'm very excited about this film. This is the the next film from writers Nat Faxon and Jim Rash. We've talked about Jim Rash before, uh, and Nat Faxon, as a matter of fact, uh, when we talked about The Descendants briefly uh, in some conversation last year. They were the writers of The Descendants this year, the way, way back. They are writing and co-directing uh, the film, starring, um, uh, let's see, Anna Sophia Robb, Steve Carell, and our uh, you know dear friend of the show, Sam Rockwell. Uh, one day we should tell him that. Um, he should be on our best friends who, ha- who haven't met us list. If he, he's not our- oh, totally. I, well, I, he and, and Jim Rash uh, both, I think, should should be on that uh, on that list. Um, and so it it's uh, it, it looks like just a great. It's sort of a what's it a cross between? There's some dirty dancing in there. There's um, a little bit of uh, um, well a- Adventureland. There's a lot of Adventureland kind of and, creeping up in here. And it has a little bit bit of that kind of that family disconnect vibe from. Um, uh, oh, I just blanked on it. This the the same producers who did this one, the bus movie, the VW bus, Little uh, Miss. Oh Sunshine. yeah, Little Miss Sunshine. Absolutely, yeah. No, that that's it. That's it. Uh, so there is. This is this is like a just a fantastic mashup of all of those kind of themes. But I uh, this is you know one of the reasons I look forward to this movie is because there are some um, creators that I feel um, uh, a a an otherwise potentially trite story will be better in their hands or, or through them as a filter of it. And I'm starting to feel that way with Faxon and Rash and that, that the stuff that they create, uh, I, I find is a, a unique perspective on a, a theme that is otherwise played. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to this movie. It looks like a, an endearing and awkward and funny uh, approach to this sort of family, demented family comedy. Absolutely. I, it was a little strange seeing Steve Carell be kind of like the the macho top yeah. figure. I was like, okay, well, that's different for him. Totally. <laughs> that yeah, was great. I wasn't expecting that. So, yeah, I I am looking forward to it, definitely. Yeah. yeah. This was uh, Otherwise, this was a big uh, trailer week. And so if you haven't uh, checked out the new featured trailers, um, you know, head over to IMDb and, and check it out. There is a new... Uh, man, there's a new Man of Steel trailer. Gives a lot of story. Um, there were a lot more of sort of story elements. Man, we see a lot of Krypton. We see a, you know a lot more of Dad. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited about that. There's a there's Hunger Games. Uh, I'm actually surprised you didn't do the uh, uh, the the, the uh, Catching Fire trailer. Mm. You're not because you're the I, you're the one who was all bullish on that stuff. No, I wasn't. Oh, sure you were. You were excited. <laughs> I was interested, but it, I wasn't overly excited. And especially after I saw the film, I was like, uh, definitely less excited. Mm. I, I think it, the second one looks better, but yeah, you know, we. I told you I did all the books, right? Did I tell you that? I thought Disconnect is one that. Yes, you did. You told me you okay. plowed through those. So. Yeah, I plowed through those, and so I'm actually interested in seeing the movie. I uh, definitely the book yeah, was better. Did the... you see that music video? The book was better. Came out during the Game of Thrones thing. I'm going to post it. It's not. It's absolutely not safe for work, but it is hysterical. Um, a uh, pay-in to uh, nerds who always read the books first and get very upset when people think that they've discovered some kind of new thing by watching the series. It's fantastic. Um, 
so uh but uh, the uh, the only other one to check out is uh, Star Trek Into Darkness. There's another new trailer for Star Trek Into Darkness and wow, it's just it's every trailer I see of this film it's not it's turning into less of the movie I expect. <laughs> and I'm so excited about it. I feel like I know less about it now that I've seen all these trailers uh, than I yeah. did before I uh, saw any of them. Well, Looks good. great. All right. Uh okay, so what are we uh why why have we gathered here around this uh auspicious virtual table? Jumping back to 1976, we're still on our little uh, run here. And we're, that's right. We're uh, we're chatting about Carrie. We we you know we uh, there's a lot of great films from 1976, and I think for the most part we managed to cover quite a variety of genres too. Yeah, I we started with Marathon Man, kind of the you know kind of a, a thriller with some elements of uh, you know historical fiction, I guess the, the with Nazis and everything. Mm-hmm. And then we jumped <laughs> You know, with Nazis and everything. You know, those, those Nazi guys. That always bodes well. I yeah, love it. it and then we jumped into Taxi Driver, uh, a very kind of heavy psychological drama. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then tonight we're doing a horror. And then, uh, you know, we've got a couple other that we're going to be doing. So, the, you know, it's a, it's a good variety, good mix. Yeah, it's a, it is a good variety. I'm um, excited to hear your thoughts on, on Carrie. Why don't you go first? This no, week? I, you know, I, okay. Um, I, uh, you know, I told you last week when I, when we started, I was excited to watch it because, uh, you know, I'd only really ever watched it from the perspective of, you know, it's a horror movie and turn out the lights and, and, and just kind of get, get spooked when I was much, you know, younger. And I, in watching it, I realized it's not, it's not really that kind of movie. And I don't really remember why, um, uh, I was so scared, but uh, because uh, you know, it's not it's not like a horror. It's not like uh, you know, uh, uh, I would compare it less to Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, you know, for example. And maybe that's the uh, that's sort of the Stephen King uh, spin on it, uh, on these sort of horror concepts. But I, I found myself, you know, I definitely kind of interested and and thrilled by it. But not, you know, I didn't find those elements of just sort of jump out of your skin horror and that's what i remembered from the experience and i just think it's funny the the sort of cultural memory that that sticks it it is interesting how how that sort of changes and i i think it probably was a lot scarier um back closer to when it came out in 1976 it has it feels a little dated with stuff now but at the same time it's really it, it's it, the psychology of it. I think yes. is what really gets you as far as the as, as far as what frightens you, and and watching the change in Carrie um, when the blood the bucket of blood falls on her at prom. I'm just going right for the spoiler. Well, you really are. So you're just <laughs> nailing it. That's right. There you go. It really um, it's frightening seeing that transformation in her and how much she changes. How quickly she changes to somebody who just is ready to kill everybody. Right, right. And, it, you know, I thought that was interesting. This was, I'm not sure what was scarier, the psychology of Carrie uh, or the complete Lord of the Flies environment in which she lived. Yeah, right. And, and kind of existed. Like she, uh, in spite of the, the clearly the changes that she was going through and the changes her body was going through she had, as she goes through sort of delayed puberty uh, and the uh you know the absolute horrific uh family experience that she has with the, with her mother that is you know far far off the deep end um in in terms of just general zealotry and and such and so um you know everyone else was in this film besides Carrie was really uh i mean there's just there was hardly anyone in there that was redeeming at all uh, you know, you, the coach, I think, was the um, uh, was kind of the saving grace, but nobody remembered her name. The other kids in school were just an absolute uh, caricature <laughs> of, you know, kids in school. I've, I, I mean, I don't know. It's been a long time since I've been in high school, but, uh, um, you know, I, I certainly don't remember it that way. But what I found so interesting about it was how much emphasis uh, or or how I think the psychology of the film plays out um, in terms of what we remember of how bad high school was. It's like this was the memory of of somebody who didn't have a great experience and yet, um, it, you know, put it under the magnifying glass under the sun. 
um, for us to experience that for Carrie. And I think that made it an, an interesting thing to watch, even though it was it was kind of always in a dream state. I think that starts with the the opening uh, credit sequence, which I I compared. <laughs> This sort of, uh, uh, you know, the opening credits for Zombieland, right? Mm -hmm. The super, super high, slow, or high, you know, high speed film, right? The slow motion uh, that you get with what was the Viper camera or whatever they used. Uh, And I have a feeling had this movie out, it'll be interesting to see what this, the remake does with the opening credits. So the opening credits is a, you know, is, is a very, very, you know, painfully slow and slow and long uh, sequence, a slow motion sequence of, um, you know, these girls in the locker room in various stages of undress. It's like Brian De Palma's Zombieland credit sequence, except for all these, all these girls are naked and moving really slow. Um, right. And it's, it is, it, it it's, um, I, I think far, far less, uh, sort of, I, I'm not sure what the, uh, what the objective was of, of the credit sequence, but I think it starts us off with this kind of, um, arty less titillating um experience of of kind of the otherworldliness that exists in the social structure of this locker room at that age um well it 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 in a, in a in an interesting way i think by slowing it down it it does take away anything that's titillating or or scintillating and creates this almost idyllic you know like greek scene of nymphs at play and it's just this really innocent scene is kind of what it creates it's just it just seems like just all this innocence you know in a way you know the slow motion just kind of takes away any of the sexuality it seems and it's it's just like frolicking nymphs and they're innocent and they're at play and then it comes in on carrie in the shower and and she's just you know just washing herself in the most uh, the most amazingly slow motion camera like you were saying it's so slow just completely absorbed in just this innocent joy of bathing until the blood starts yeah yeah and then and, and then the the nymphs you know turn into just monsters yeah and that's pretty much the tone that sticks for the rest of the film it's it's well off and on throughout the film because it does it does fluctuate a little bit you yeah. know you have you have uh what's her name sue right played by amy, amy irving, irving right? who who in you know it's an interesting character but it's interesting how she kind of is playing along with the with the wickedness i mean she's the one who starts essentially the the maxi pad stoning right in the shower um and but but over the course of the story, you start getting this sense that she's not necessarily evil. Maybe she's just doing it to to get attention. You you don't really get a clear sense of her, except that there is something in her that's drawn to Carrie and drawn to trying to find the goodness in Carrie. In a way, it's almost like you know she realizes from that opening scene how how hurtful she is and and tries to reverse it tries to find a way out of that darkness it's almost like she has foresight into the evil that is to come within carrie and is now trying to find a way to stop it yeah and and i think you know uh, what what is interesting about sue's character uh you know by the end of the film I don't know how much we, we you yeah, know, we're, we're jumping around, whatever. So the the end of the film, Carrie, uh, through the course of the film, I should say, we, we Carrie discovers that in addition to, you know, all of the other changes that her mom has been keeping a secret from her, um, she discovers that she has this sort of newfound ability uh, as a telekinetic. And so there she is learning how to move things with her mind, and she's reading all these books about moving things with her mind. And then, uh, so when uh, these uh, the miscreant teens, not including Sue Snell, Amy Irving's character, uh, come together and uh, drop the uh, the pig's blood on her, and uh, you know some of the girls are laughing, uh, others try to leave. Carrie goes berserk, and the and she you know she literally does beat most of the children with a fire hose with her mind right. and right. everything burns down and at the end she's in her house and she she we can talk about the experience with her mother bottom line is 
her world completely crumbles. Many, many people die. And the way the movie ends with Sue Snell, who has been the, the sort of center of redemption for the film. She was the one who decided that the peer pressure was, you know, she was going to combat the peer pressure and try to make sure that this, this outcast had a good time. She is the one who ends up being essentially cursed uh, as we see her wake up from this horrifying dream uh, of being pulled uh, into um, Carrie's grave. Um, and uh, so she is screaming and screaming and screaming, and her mom is is holding her and trying to comfort her. But you can tell she's she's the one who's going to be cursed for, um, you know, for life from this experience, uh, even though she was the one who was trying to make good. And I think yeah. that's a, that makes her kind of a, a pivotal point of this uh, or a pivotal character in this film. And it's it she she's sort of the one to watch, even though we don't get as much of her um, because of our focus on Carrie and the horrible things going on in her orbit. Right, exactly. Yeah, Sue Sue is a very interesting character and uh, it's I, I I would like a little bit more of her, but uh, you know, there's enough to just pique your curiosity about what is the psychology making her up? Why is she uh going through these motions to try to um help Carrie? It's I mean, I I find it so strange that in their senior prom, she essentially offers up her boyfriend to go to the dance with uh, with Carrie, it, it's it, it's that it's, seemed uh, that seemed a touch mature. Yeah, it, well, you know. it's 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 mature, and also it's just <laughs> weird. Yeah, it's just strange. It's, it's like really here you you go with him, especially. I mean, Tommy Ross, her boyfriend, played by um, uh, the greatest American hero, William Cat, uh, is you know he he starts kind of falling for Carrie in a strange way. And it's just, I, I just don't understand the psychology that was going through Sue's head when she willingly throws her boyfriend at another yeah. girl to go to prom. And Here, then you take goes, her. and then goes, sneaks into prom to watch <laughs> to from see, around the corner. <laughs> to see how happy this, this girl is now. Yeah. It's strange. It's, it's, it's really strange. I don't fully understand. I, I've never read the book. I'd, I'd be curious to see if there's more in the, uh, in the psychology of that, uh, that, decision in the book that that is played out yeah i i would agree with that that was a that that was a bit of a tough one to swallow yeah <laughs> uh the other let's see the other girls if i get these characters right so uh we had uh, uh what was the the one who actually pulled the rope was that that's Norma? nancy or, allen that that's, was that's nancy allen chris harginson uh, chris harginson right 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 yeah. okay and uh the other girls that we had in the so there was uh amy irving Nancy Allen, um, PJ Souls. PJ Souls, who was in Stripes, one of the MPs, my very favorite movie. And then the the strangest one to see for me yes. was Edie, Edie McClurg. I don't know if that's who you were thinking I was about to say, but it seeing, was not. Who? See, tell me why. See, Edie she McClurg, was Helen. She she is just oh, oh my forever God. Yes. burned uh, into oh. my brain as a middle aged secretary. Yes, from Ferris or, Bueller, or from Ferris Bueller, or the uh, the um the lady at the airline ticket counter in planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> you just you have her burned into your head in these sorts of roles, totally. and seeing her as a high school kid, uh, like just this malicious high school kid. I just I I had I don't think I ever connected that she was in this movie, and then this time I'm like, oh my, is that Edie? McClurg and sure enough it was it just it really surprised me to see her in the film that was what was that great line uh from Ferris Bueller uh uh yeah. with your bad knee Ed you shouldn't be throwing anybody I <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, loved that uh, she is great, but you're right. That's, a, a, yeah. uh, that was shocking. She had those big glasses on in this movie, yes, right? Those big yes, 1976 exactly. glasses. Right. But who were you thinking I was going to say? I oh, know. I've totally lost the thread. Uh, oh, well. We also had uh, uh, John Travolta and William Catt uh, yeah. playing the, uh, the, uh, the boys. And uh, John Travolta gets to kill a pig with a sledgehammer. In this film, which <laughs> yeah. which may have been the most uh you know the most terrifying uh scene of violence in the film <laughs> it it really was horrifying and it's funny there are scenes that stick in your head in this film that never go away like right. the high school in flames and the scenes with the mother that scene i had completely forgotten about and it totally took me by surprise that that's what happened i really didn't see that coming and I know. it really it's it's like 
Damn. Do you know what it is about that about those scenes? And I think that this is an area where where potentially Carrie um, kind of excels. Normally, this would be a great opportunity uh, to tell us the story of finding the pig blood. Yeah. Uh, and to make the choice to actually show us the collection of the pig blood, and particularly the love of showing us the 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 pig blood that uh, you know it, it shows sort of the the rage filled kind of glee that John Travolta with which he approaches the 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 hammer as he sort of rescues his buddy who can't can't do it and so he he jumps into the pen and isolates a pig and then just starts going to town on it with his sledgehammer and then getting it into the the um uh, I don't even know what you call it the place where you collect the blood the the bleeding area right what is that called Andy you from your farm life <laughs> Uh, the bleeding area. It's the that's, bleeding, the bleeding pit. That's what we call it. And and the, both of these, John Travolta and um, um, what's Nancy, her name? Nancy again? Allen. Nancy Allen are are there. They have such uh, such a fervor about the experience that they're going through, the excitement on their face, and and uh, you know, be be good, and I'll let you pull the rope. You know, I mean, it, it was. It, it's just there's a lot of excitement in that, uh, in a really sort of grotesque. Um, process uh that is you know the most sort of tangibly real process of violence in the film everything it's, else is your sort of distance from it because it's it's a little bit uh, supernatural you know what i'm saying yeah absolutely in a way um yes they're the antagonists in the film uh, they represent really true evil but it's it's frightening at what level it comes because it's just it's something i mean i know we're watching a horror film but you just don't expect to, to watch somebody you know beat a pig to death and then you know bleed it so that they can do this horrible horrible prank it just seems like that's so extreme for a prank <laughs> you know, maybe, yes you know you know maybe a bucket of, of fake blood or something but no they actually slaughter a pig yeah. drain the blood and then and then dump it on her. I mean, it's so extreme. Well, it goes so back it's, to it's, that. It, it goes back to that same experience of the film itself, of just the world in which we are living as we're watching. You know, spending the our two hours watching this film is uh, a, a world in it where the darkness of the high school social structure is magnified, and that I think goes uh, absolutely into the choices that the antagonist uh, antagonists make. Uh, it is magnified it's not paint it's not fake blood it's it's the real deal right absolutely uh so let's uh, you know you haven't read the novel i haven't read the novel um so i i, I feel kind of ill-equipped to talk about this as an adaptation but i i would like to hear your thoughts on old uh, de palma well i i really enjoy brian de palma i think um you know, he's a fascinating director we've talked about him a number of times on the show um, just in passing, we haven't, I don't think talked about any of his films before, No, but he's a director who I think can make some absolutely fascinating films. He's also a director who's made some absolute bombs and stinkers, but every time I feel like he is a person who is playing with the tools of cinema and trying new things and doing unique, uh, unique tricks that you don't see very often. I really enjoy watching his films, even the stinkers, because I, I still think there are things to see in them that he's doing that are worth worth seeing. And and Carrie is certainly um, not one of the stinkers. It's a it's a fantastic one that uh, that he does with a lot of his tricks, a lot of really interesting camera angles that he has. He's got um, his editing style, the way he shoots and edits. I find absolutely fascinating. A perfect example early on in the film after. The um, the shower incident when when Carrie is is you know has all the the tampons and everything thrown at her they let her they excuse her from school she's walking home we see her walking down the sidewalk and we see this kid on a bicycle weaving in and out of the trees as he uh, kind of passes her and goes by and then he turns around and starts coming back and as he's weaving between the trees we cut from a shot on one side of the trees to see him weaving and then we then we cut to a shot on the other side of the trees as we see him go around the other side and we're kind of cutting back and forth between these two sides of the tree helping us uh you know focus our attention on the kid rather than Carrie as who walks down the sidewalk but in a way that's still unsettling and so when the kid all of a sudden rides by her and screams at her creepy Carrie creepy Carrie we're totally expecting her to 
to be on edge because of this, because of the way that he's built up uh, us up to that moment. So why, from a uh, from uh, the perspective of of the 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 camera choice, is it is, is that particular sequence unsettling? It's not expected. We don't normally do that. We're also following Carrie at that moment. And then all of a sudden, we're not following Carrie. We're now jumping back and forth behind the tree as this kid is weaving around. And it pulls us out of what we were paying attention to, which is right. Carrie walking home. All of a sudden, we're now following this kid. And we're in a way that's very disorienting because we're now we're bouncing back and forth on opposite sides of the tree until the kid bikes past her again and and uh, yells at her. And just the, the way that he, all of a sudden he throws that in, in a way that we're not expecting because we were focusing on Carrie, that's what really kind of gives us this unsettled feeling that there's something else that's going to be going on here. Well, that's what I love about this choice. And, and I, you know, I had written down that same uh, sequence as one that I thought was really interesting, um, mostly because, you know, when you're, when you're, when somebody is teaching you to make film, uh, they're telling you things, you know, and I, I, you know, my role was obviously more, um, uh, documentary than, than, uh, feature. Uh, but it, it, you know, when you're doing interviews, they tell you never break that sort of 180 degree line. You know, you, you want right. to keep the camera on the same side of, of the action. And, uh, they, you know, I, I had this conversation with my film school instructor who said, don't, uh, don't break that rule because it, it ends up becoming an unsettling experience for the viewer. And here you are using that very word uh, and talking about how how well it works to create that unsettling environment. And I think that's a that is a great demonstration of why um, of some of De Palma's experimentation that that really does work. And in in the context of this film, I think it works very very well. And and he does that all through whether it's yeah. that whether it's zooming, which you know goes in and out of fashion, the zooming rather right. than moving the camera. Um, also uh, the um, the the uh, split diopter that mm -hmm. he uses a couple times to so which we saw in all the president's men the same year right. but the way that you're focusing on two different things very far far apart is it's a very interesting way to play with that and just the way that he puts one thing so close to the camera and then the other thing far away I mean he really plays all of that up um, to enhance the genre that he's working with the horror genre. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think you can see in some of his other films that came, you know, reasonably close uh, after, uh, you know, I think leading into, uh, uh, you know, Scarface uh, as a, a particular example of how he deals with just, you know, horrific violence um, in in a pretty gritty and real way. You, you sort of see that development um, you know, in, in I, I'm not a big fan of, of, you know, where his, his skills took him after, say, the Untouchables, uh, Casualties of War. I mean, I, I was interested in Casualties of War. Car I... Carlito's Way is a great film if you cut the first 10, 15 minutes off. <laughs> oh, you have we... to get past that? Well, no, it's he gives away the ending. Yeah. I, I think yeah. that it's yeah. better if he doesn't. Uh, Mission Impossible, the first one's not too bad. It's, it's not, no, it's, not... it's it's one of those that, you, that I remember loving it in 1996, and I can't yeah. stand it. It just it, that was a, that's a first viewing movie. It just is not. It well, I haven't seen it since probably 98 or doesn't so. doesn't hold so, yeah. up. It's terrible. Uh, Femme Fatale, actually, I, I've talked about a few times on the show, was surprisingly uh, much better than I ever would have expected. That was 2002. And Passion, which hasn't come out yet, from uh, he made it in 2012, hasn't had a, a U.S. release date yet, I don't believe. I'm very curious about that because it does look like he's going back to this psychological thriller sort of roots. Mm -hmm. Even when he's doing his films that are the stinkers, like The Bonfire of the Vanities, or snake eyes, there are still elements in those that are really fascinating. And even the split screen, which is something we haven't talked about uh, yet, but the way that he uses split screen, um, he's one of the only filmmakers who still uses split screen and it does it really effectively. And it's fascinating to see what he pairs on the screen to look at. We see it in Carrie, uh, in those other films that I mentioned, we see it. I think Quentin Tarantino started using split screen because his uh, yeah. affinity for Brian De Palma. Soderbergh too. And so, what has he done? Oh man, uh, go watch any the of oceans, the oceans. Movies. Yeah, the oceans it's, films. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Epic. Uh, and right. uh, so, uh, you know, I wonder. It's been it's been ten years since I've seen Blowout. I wonder how well that holds up. I remember really, really liking that movie. Yeah, I really liked Blowout. I mean, a lot of his films from the seventies and eighties I enjoyed. 
Uh, the '90s was a, a rougher Tough. decade for him, yeah. but uh, you know, he still. There, I still say, even you look at the bad ones, there are still elements that show that he's he's pushing the bounds of filmmaking and he's trying new things and he's doing unique things with uh, with film. And I I say he's definitely worth looking at. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Uh, you know, I, it, it's one of those sort of schizophrenic relationships. You know, I'm I'm I absolutely uh, respect what he did with Carrie and and the material and. Um, you know, that makes me come back and then get disappointed again from a movie like, uh, you know, Kane. Uh, yeah, Terrible. I know. At the I very know. bottom of my list. I would watch Rush first. Well, you should watch Femme Fatale and tell me what you think. That I, was uh, I, Ro- Rebecca Romaine Stamos. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. Um, and Antonio, Antonio Banderas. Banderas. See. Yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah. It's good. How about Black it's Dahlia? What would you think of Black Dahlia? It's terrible. It's terrible. 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 See, there we go. Oh, I know. I missed Redacted. That didn't play here. So I need to p- catch up on that one. So, you know, it's, you know, he's hit and miss, but I, I do always enjoy seeing what he's, how he's playing with film. All right. I like that too. Who else do we need to talk about on Carrie? What, uh, well, the, uh... something, uh, something else before we uh, uh, leave the actors, uh, I wanted to mention something that I found really interesting in the film. Uh, and actually, I, I read about it in a uh, a blog that um, it's called Senses of Cinema. I'll, we can put the link up on our on our notes. The interesting nature of males in this film, uh, as as compared yeah. to females, that it's it really is a, a female driven film. The males are either non existent, like Carrie's father, like Sue's father. Um, or there are these kind of uh, ineffective boyfriends that don't really do much. Like, well, I mean, John Travolta does kill the pig, but other than that, he's he's kind of just an ineffective boyfriend. And, <laughs> oh yes, John Travolta, he does kill the pig. <laughs> he does kill the pig. And William Cat, who who represents, in a way, he's almost like the 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 um, most good character in the film. And it's interesting that. He almost has this androgynous look to him. He's got this crazy blonde fro, and <laughs> curly fro. It, yeah, this curly fro, and it gives him this this look of of kind of almost being a little feminine. And I found him a really fascinating character uh, because of that. And uh, uh, you, you know, know I, I mean, d- you didn't feel the same way about John Travolta. I mean, he just because he, he had long he, flowing hair, he's just a brunette. He's the he's got the seventies. He's got the seventies hair going. Yeah. And yes, it's it's longer, but it just felt like seventies guy hair. It still felt it still felt like a guy, I guess. I don't know. But but uh, I don't know. Just Tommy's hair is just so big, blonde, glowing, that the amazing <laughs> tripod or the um the um the the scene when they're on the dolly in the dance and he and Carrie are dancing and it's her first time ever dancing. Right. And you've got this this beautiful shot. This is another great example of of De Palma's uh, playing with the camera, where the dolly is going in circles around them, and they are on a platform spinning the opposite direction. And it is a dizzying, dizzying shot. And it's it's dizzying in a way that you're you're glowing and you're thrilled with this, you know, falling in love for the first time and 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 having this experience. And the way that the light hits his hair, it's just like this glowing god. He is or, that's one of the interesting things. He is made almost more beautiful than she is. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Really, I mean, the way it re- it reflects, even though in that sequence we are there to see how well she polishes up. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Uh, and yet it's it's tough. William Cat is such a beautiful man. <laughs> <laughs> he really is the greatest American hero. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh goodness. Okay. He was in um a film that as bad as it probably is, I haven't seen it since it came out in theaters, but I hold a place in my heart for it because I loved it so much at the time, and that was House. Uh, that film, it's a, probably just a completely terrible horror film, but I, you know, at the time I just completely loved it. It's like kind of a horror comedy. I, don't, I honestly don't think I've seen it. It's, it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it when it came out. I, gosh, I'm tempted to watch it again, but I don't, don't want it. I You'll don't want screw it, it all. Up. I know it's, it is, it's going to completely mess it up. So. Um, and then I think the last person that I was going to mention cast. Well, we have to. We haven't talked about Piper. We'll come back to Piper right. real quick. But Betty Buckley, um, she played the uh, the gym teacher, 
And, uh, you know, she's from eight is enough. She was around for a long time for anyone who grew up back then and watched eight is enough on TV. Definitely, uh, saw a lot of Betty Buckley and, uh, and, uh, she's, uh, she was great to see in this. I had forgotten that she's in here. She got to play a very ineffective gym coach who also got to slap her students around. (laughs) Can we, that is an interesting point that I, I made a note of. We haven't talked about it yet. There is an unreal amount of slapping in this film. Yeah, there is. Everybody, I think every character gets a chance to wallop one another in the face. Yeah, Carrie gets slapped by uh, her coach. Uh, coach also slaps um, uh, uh, Nancy Allen. Right. And uh, who the else girls, The girls slap each other. Yeah. Uh, uh, John Travolta slaps his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they, I just there's a lot of slapping. I made a note of that. The slapping was the uh, the emotional reaction of choice. Absolutely. Uh, the physical manifestation of an emotional reaction of discomfort was the slap. And uh, I was very moved by that. I was very <laughs> moved by the slapping. A lot of slapping. A lot of slapping. Um, Nancy Allen, we talked about already, but um, she appeared in a good number of of Brian De Palma films. And they actually ended up getting married for, um, for I think, four or five years. Um, they were... Gosh, what else has she been in with him? She did... I'm blanking. She did uh, home movies, Dressed to Kill and Blow Out with, uh, with De Palma. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she was in Blow Out. Yeah. He, he's a guy who likes to use the same people over and over again. Yeah. And uh, not just his cast, but also his crew. Uh, you know, he uses um, uh, his, a lot of the same composers time after time. Uh, Pino Donaggio, who did the music for this film, also did home movies, Dressed to Kill, Blowout, Body Double, Raising Kane. You know, he uh, the same cinematographers he'll come back to time and time again. He really taps into that, and I enjoy that. I think he he you know really finds the right team to work with for the right film, and and comes back to them time after time. And I think it it works well for him. You want to talk about Piper Laurie? Yeah, Piper Laurie. Um, She's been in. A thousand movies and TV shows. She is a busy lady. She is a, a very busy lady. Yeah. Gosh, she's uh, what is she now? She's eighty. Um, gotta be uh, born in what does that mean? Nineteen thirty-two. Uh, yeah. So, so she's yeah, she's eighty. Eighty-one. Eighty-one. Yeah, she has been around for a long time. She actually took a ten-year hiatus from acting. And I, I'm not sure why, but uh, from the mid '60s until this film, she kind of took a break. And somebody, I can't remember who, uh, mentioned her to uh, to Brian De Palma, and he's just like, "Oh yeah, I loved her in The Hustler. That would be an interesting choice." And he went and met with her because uh, she was wanting to get back into the scene, and he just totally fell in love with her for the part. It re- he really felt like she was perfect to play Margaret White. Her hair. Uh, the way she dressed, she had this this um, uh, this kind of like haunting, frightening sexuality about her that didn't seem like you know her hair wasn't pulled back in a tight bun. That the way that they portray these these uptight uh, religious zealots sometimes, you know, there is still something very feminine about her. The way that she has her hair just kind of like this this big thing of hair coming down. Um, she had that look and her role in this film. I don't know. I, I think it always frightened me, uh, every time I've seen this film and it's just one of those, one of those, um, roles that just is burns into your head and you don't forget how much she scares you because the psychology of her and when she dragged Carrie into the closet that first time, I mean, that just, you know, the fact that this is the girl's mother. And she's yeah. locking in her in a closet, making her pray, and all of this sort of stuff. I mean, it, it really is terrifying. And well, I, it's, it, you're right. It's it's terrifying because there's the there's the sort of psychological aspect of it, but then there's the direct physical aspect of it, uh, as she's you know hugging her daughter and trying to console her and picks up a knife. Yeah. Uh, and and stabs her. I mean, it's a it's it, that that sort of um, where when the two women now reconcile their relationship uh by stabbing one another mm-hmm. uh and then being buried under the remains of their house <laughs> right right 
uh, getting sucked back into hell. <laughs> yeah, there's a certain literal interpretation to the uh, this sort of uh, mother daughter relationship that they uh, execute in this sequence that I think is very powerful. <laughs> it's yeah, it's absolutely frightening. It's absolutely frightening. It's funny, Piper Laurie, she thought when they were making this film that it was more of a horror comedy because she felt that she was playing the role so over the top that she had no um, inkling that this was actually a serious horror. <laughs> so it's funny. <laughs> it's, I, I found that very funny that she was just like, oh, this has to be just a silly, a silly little thing. Oh, she, yeah. It, it, you know, the, the sequences, you, you, looking at the script and, and I think reading the, the dialogue between Margaret White and Carrie, it, I, I don't know which is more uh, compelling, uh, watching them perform it together or, you know, reading it. The, the, uh, the way she um, breaks Carrie uh, in every single sequence, every line is, is directed at, at breaking her in some way, whether it's breaking her physically or emotionally, psychologically. Uh, you know, pimples are the Lord's way of chastising you. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, those, just those little things. Um, that, well, geez, even just having a period, yeah, and, and yeah. saying that you know you've spited the Lord, basically, yeah, it's exactly, like, geez, yeah, uh, there, you know, the, <laughs> when she starts, she refers to uh, Carrie's breasts as dirty pillows, uh, and fi- that was the sequence when when Carrie comes back and says, you know, breasts, Mama, they're called breasts, and every woman has them, uh, mm-hmm. and and we that was, uh, I, I think the. Um, that really the turning point for, you know, for me sort of witnessing their relationship when she takes her power back uh, and, and you start realizing that she's, that there may be some hope. Yeah. And that's what makes the, the climax of the film, I think, so difficult to watch is that there, there was an opportunity for her. Uh, and, and I think that's to the credit of, uh, of, I think Stephen King is a, uh, you know, conceptualizing the story um, you know, being able to really look at the the humanity of this sort of small town relationship between the mother and daughter, and see that you know the the more powerful loss is the loss of 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 Carrie's ability to get out of that relationship, whether or not she ends up dead, she didn't make it. Um, right. You know, she ended up you know dead under the house with her mom. Yeah. Uh, and that's a that's more sad, I think, in the way they they sort of pitch it, um, than the actual horror elements. Yeah, it's I mean it's it's it is definitely there's a lot of the psychological horror in this film. It's not just, you know, blood pouring from the ceiling sort of right. horror. It really plays on both of those which which Stephen King does so well. Which is too bad. What are your thoughts on the on the artwork? Right? I mean the image that we get, the original poster artwork is is a split screen or interesting. We see Carrie with the with the tiara and happy as a prom queen and and Carrie seconds later covered in pig blood. Um is that does that give it away too much for you now that you have sort of thought about it? it you know, it does. I I I hadn't really thought about it. Um, the tagline is funny. If you've got a taste for terror, take Carrie to the prom. Yeah, right. <laughs> if only they knew she had the power. Nineteen seventy six was was not a good year for tra- yeah. for tags and trailers and stuff. Yeah, no, it doesn't work so well. Yeah. You know, they. Um, I, I guess they have to let you know it's a horror film, but they could have found a better way to do it. I think. I think yeah. they're giving a little too much away with that. I'm not. Uh, I mean, talk about spoilers. You know that poster. I guess it's relying on the fact that you've read the book and you know the scenes, or uh, you haven't read the book but you're curious. You know how this woman ends up. You know, bathed in blood like that. Yeah, I guess that's. That's, something that's we're going to celebrate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't, you know, uh, we haven't we haven't talked about Sissy Spacek really at all. I, yeah. She's I think she's really terrifying in this role. I, she, I there's yeah. something about her that right from the opening she seems off and she plays that really well. Broken. I mean that's to me it's just she's this is what it looks like to be completely broken. Yeah. Uh, even from, you know, just watching her, the level of distance uh, in the shower and then the the degree to which she freaks out yeah. on screen is uh, amazing to me to watch that sequence. That was uh, it was um, it was terrifying to watch just because of the the 
the level that she was able to take that scene. And, and you know, I was sort of torn watching it, thinking, is this, is this a little much? But uh, as you watch the rest of the of the film play out and realize just how damaged she is and how on the edge of, of you know, complete breakdown she is just walking down the street. Right. Um, you know, she plays one heck of an introvert. Nominated for an Oscar for this film. Yes. One of her, one, two, three, four, five, six Oscar nominations. She didn't win uh, for this film. She won for Coal Miner's Daughter a few years later. But uh, great actress. And uh, I think I think it, she was, uh, it was, you know, definitely a role that uh, was worthy of being nominated. She was up against uh, um, uh, Liv Ullman in Face to Face. Talia Shire in Rocky, Marie Christine Baralt in Cousin Cousin, and Faye Dunaway in Network. And who won? Is that uh, Faye, Faye Dunaway? Dunaway. Faye Dunaway, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And Piper Laurie was also nominated for a supporting, supporting actress. Yeah. yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's uh, have the, the movie. Let's talk about the numbers, shall we? It did. It did good. This was, uh, you know, Brian De Palma had done a good number of films before this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine films before this. This was really his breakout film. This is the film that uh, at the at the time, 1970, 1976, was the film that had made the most money for him and really kind of pushed him into that next uh uh, next level of of filmmaking they made this for i found it 1.8 uh, million dollars and the film ended up making 33.8 million dollars domestically so it did well for itself yeah it's uh, you know i'm not sure if that surprised me um that I, it, that you know, I think you know, nineteen seventy six dollars. That makes a lot of sense. I'm, I I don't know if I was surprised it made as mu- so much or made that much. You mean you that? Well, I I think it's a horror film. I I don't know. I'm not quite sure um, what drew people to it, but yeah. it, it was just one of those things that, um, you know, it's it was regarded one of the best films of the year. A lot of people went and saw it. They were, I mean, it was a horror. It was definitely a terrifying horror film that really drew people in um the critics loved it 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 was very highly reviewed and the audiences just just came in droves to go see it so it's it was just one of those films that just hit at the right time and you know it was stephen king's first uh first book that was published so in a way this this uh the book hadn't been on the bestseller list yet this film and the book probably also helped boost each other up so right. that Stephen King and the film both were able to kind of, and Brian De Palma were both able to kind of make out of this and start really kind of cranking some bigger and better stuff out. Uh, bigger and better, not like The Rage, Carrie 2. No, not, uh, not definitely which, not. Which did bring back, um, uh, it was written by Stephen King. Well, he got a writing credit but for the characters, but it was uh, written by Raphael Moreau. Uh, Amy Irving made it into uh, the sequel, but uh, it, was a, it went directly to television and uh, starred Mina Suivari. And, oh, poor uh, thing. Yeah, so that it's- was... 1999. Another, another teenager with telekinetic powers who is revealed to have a shared father with Carrie. Oh, so, goodness. Yeah. Not good. Not a good uh, sequel, but uh, the original we like. This is also notoriously, um, they made a Broadway musical version of Carrie back in 1988. That was a huge flop. It closed after only 16 previews and five performances. Just Betty Buckley, uh, who we talked about already, she actually was in it, um, and it just was such a bomb that it actually there was a um, a what was it a book or something that came out uh, at some point later uh, called "Not Since Carrie: Forty Years of Broadway Musical Flops." So it was so <laughs> bad that they even used it in the title, talking about uh, famous famous flops on Broadway. So, oh. God, I you know wish I would have loved to have seen that one. And you know what's funny is that they hired the guy who wrote um, the the Spider Man Broadway bomb, Spider Man Turn Off the Dark, uh, to write the new Carrie adaptation. 
the the new Carrie adaptation with uh, we that's with coming Chloe. out this year with Chloe uh, right. Moretz. Um, and that I should add, uh, we we didn't talk. I didn't mention this during the trailer segment, but the new trailer came out for Carrie uh, yep. this week, this very t- uh, this a couple of days ago, I guess. Maybe too. And you know, it's interesting. I I actually read something because I know when we first saw the teaser for that, we were like, "Wow, I don't remember Carrie pretty much setting the entire town on fire." Yeah. That um, apparently that something like that does happen in the book, where she starts exploding gas stations and stuff like that. And that was something that they deemed too expensive to to do. Yeah, and you, so you they kind of get that f- yeah. that feel. Uh, you know, when she blows up the car uh, in the 76 carry, you know, at the yeah. end and the car it makes a, you know, slightly larger explosion than it maybe should. And, uh, but I can see why, why that would have been yep. a rather exhaustive to film. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of fire, lots of explosions. Right. Right. Uh, I'm, you know, based on this, I'm actually looking forward to the, to the next, uh, the next carry. The next. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to see uh, if anything, because I, I like Chloe Grace Moretz. Yeah, uh, and I've I've liked the other things that she's she's done, and and um, uh, watching her sort of uh, grow up and maybe grow into this role a little bit should be interesting, or sort of grow down. She's a little bit uh, hyper sophisticated. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, she is. And I I'm very curious to see how she you know how she plays it down. You see a lot more of her in the trailer release this week, um, and and so it's worth checking out to to see kind of the direction they're going to take it. Nice. Yeah. And of course, Julianne Moore in uh, as as Margaret White. Uh, you know, I, I don't. I I quite like Julianne Moore, and um, uh, I I think she looks certainly looks the part. Uh, that that film. to me, when I saw that they cast her, seemed to be the most correct casting in yeah. the film. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, very excited to see how that comes together. Yep. Uh, what else do you have before we flick chart? Um. Last little bits, the um, uh, the mother who uh, plays Sue's mother is really Amy Irving's mother. So Sue is uh, played by Amy Irving, and Sue's mother, um, Mrs. Snell, is played by Priscilla Pointer, Amy Irving's mother in real life. Who is, who's done other things. Yes, who has done a lot of other things. She's done a lot of other things. <laughs> yes. Um, Sissy Spacek was not considered for the role, but the art director, Jack Fisk, who was on board the film to do the art direction for the film, convinced Brian De Palma uh, to let her audition. He was, uh, they, are, they were married, Jack Fisk and Sissy Spacek, and still are. They're a, a very long-lasting Hollywood couple. They've been married since 1974. He convinced Brian to let Sissy audition, and she came in, and uh, and she won him over. She put Vaseline in her hair. She didn't shower for a few days, and she wore this really awful, like little sailor dance outfit that her mother had given her when she was young to the audition. And uh, because she just played it so well, she ended up getting the part and uh, really making a name for herself from it. Well, and 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 to that point, I mean, when you think of these, um, uh, these sort of terrifying horror characters. Uh, man, Carrie is is certainly top ten. Just the the image, even if you've never seen the movie, the image that that is that that comes up when you think about Carrie uh, from the poster, you know, covered in blood and her eyes all wigged out. Just the way that at once the blood pours on her, the way yeah. that she moves through the rest of the film is really terrifying. Yeah, uh, nothing. Just, yeah, it, it all just, seems off. She's so she's she's so taut. You know, she's yeah. like like just a ball of rubber bands, and and you can just feel it. You can just really feel uh, what she is going through there. She she does a great job in that sequence. Last little bit, she was so focused on doing everything herself in her role that she told Brian De Palma at the very end of the film, she had to be the one whose hand reached out from under the rocks. <laughs> So that was really Sissy's hand. That was really Sissy's hand. So they built a box under these rocks, and she was <laughs> buried under these rocks there yeah. just to reach out and uh, just a you know dedication to her role. Fantastic little uh, stuff. That's good. Yep. That's very good. Yep. So, all right. You ready? Yes, let's do it. So we're flick charting uh, uh, Carrie. You can go find us at flickchart.com slash the next reel. All right. First up, Carrie or the Sandlot? Well, the Sandlot. Mm-hmm. I'm torn. You know, I have a I have a penchant for 
horror movies. So I I'm, I'm this, kind might be, of, this might be difficult. I know I'm kind of drawn to carry more, um, but I'll go with Sandlot because that's definitely one that I can put on with the family more. Mm -hmm. Carrie or the Parallax View? I'd go with Carrie. Parallax View is really great. It is. <sighs> Well, I you know I'm I'll, I'm going to give you Carrie on this one, but uh, uh, there there's an awful lot of of uh, of substance in uh, Parallax View that I f I feel like doesn't necessarily hit that bar in uh, in Carrie. I can I can see your point, but I I think there are elements to Carrie just the the psychological nature of her relationship yeah. with her mother. I find uh, you know that okay. that that really pulls me in. So, all right, Carrie or The Dark Knight Rises. Dark Knight Rises. Oh, I totally would go Carrie. <laughs> oh, God, Dark Knight Rises. The more uh, the distance I am from it, the less I like that film. I don't. I just can't. I don't even know if I could muscle. I, you know, I'm going to give again. you. I'm going to give into your passion on this one. But I, I, for the record, I still like Dark Knight Rises. Uh, and I like. I, 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 uh, I, I particularly uh, am attached to to some of the to Bane as a character choice in that film. And I, apart from his death. Which was horrifying and stupid, terrible, ridiculous. Uh, I really liked what they did with him. Yeah. So you can have it. All right, Carrie or Twenty Eight Days Later. Twenty Eight Days Later. I'll agree with you on that one. All right, there we go, number forty-seven. All right, that feels pretty good. Excellent. Yeah, it does. About halfway in the, about in the can middle. Can you believe that's about in, about in the middle? We've been doing this. I know. Man, seventy-eight. Cranking through these things, Cranking man. Cranking through it. We'll have all movies done uh, soon. That's right. We're working on every movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what are we doing next week? We're again switching genres. We're going to jump over to the Western and we're going to watch uh, the fantastic Clint Eastwood film, The Outlaw Josie Wales. Oh, I can't wait. What a great, great film this is. Holy smokes. I know. I haven't watched it in uh, probably about five years. I'm very much looking forward to watching it again because it's just, it's a great take on the Western. It's a great a uh, twist to the Western. So, and, I, you know, it's particularly fun, I think, to watch this film, um, you know, after having seen... Uh, uh, like Unforgiven? Yeah, it, it, well, it, af, uh, watching him uh, as an aging actor. Yeah. You know, we're sort of of that... I mean, you know, I was, what, four or five years old when, when this movie came, was in the theaters? Uh, I I don't remember... I saw Josie Wales on on VHS, you know, in high school. Yeah, and uh, and I didn't really make a connection, but now I've seen so many Clint Eastwood movies since then. When I put this one on today, um, and I, I just watched, you know, the first ten minutes of it, just watching him uh, as a as a performer, as a young, uh, well, he wasn't, you know, like eighteen, but he was, you know, as a younger man was. Uh, right. It's just so compelling to watch his energy on screen. I'm I'm so excited to get through the rest of this film and talk about it next week. Absolutely, I can't wait. It's uh, it's a, a great western, one of my favorites of his, and I'm I'm definitely looking forward to it again. Well, if anything, it really highlights the just like you said the the weight of 1976 that we're jumping from horror to you know political thriller now to western, and they all you know hit the same year. What does that say about sort of the cultural relevance of of moviegoers that they were accepting of all of these films to the to the degree that they were. Absolutely, I think that's a great. Uh, this is a great testament to that. Uh, all right, I got I got nothing else. Yeah, I think we hit it all, man. All right, well that doesn't. Wonderful matter. talk, great film. Can't wait to uh, put it again uh, when Halloween rolls around. Are we doing something not horror this year? <gasps> Did I? I shouldn't say that. Are you giving things away? <laughs> we wanted to take a moment to thank you for your continued support over the years. It's hard to believe that we've been having weekly in-depth discussions about movies since 2011. That's right, 12 years and counting. Producing this show is a labor of love for us, but it does require a lot of time and effort each week. If you enjoy our podcast and would love to help keep it going, there are some easy ways you can show your support. One is by using our Originals page to shop for the original source material that movies we've discussed were based on. That's right. In season one alone, we covered 13 films adapted from books or plays, from Charlie Kaufman's adaptation to David Fincher adaptations like Fight Club. 
In season two, we covered even more, like Powell and Pressburger's The Red Shoes and The African Queen from our series about legendary cinematographer Jack Cardiff. We can't forget about the four Jason Bourne movies we talked about. Love those movies. Well, the original trilogy, at least. (laughs) For our Richard D. Zanuck series, we did Jaws, Rush, Big Fish, and more. And for our horror series, we talked about John Carpenter's The Thing, which was adapted from Who Goes There? We did our first great car chase series with movies like Bullet, The French Connection, and Drive. And for the holidays, we did Preston Sturgis' Christmas in July. We had a great John Huston series with adaptations like The Maltese Falcon and The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And for our baseball series, Moneyball with Brad Pitt. Have I told you lately how much I love that movie? Uh, Yeah, I think you have. Plus our Magician series and Heist film series had adaptations as well tons of page-to-screen gems. Listeners can find the details and links to the original material at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book, play, or movie you buy through our links helps support the show, and it's no extra cost to you. So dive in and get your next read today. Thenextreel.com slash originals has all the films adapted from other sources that not only we have covered, but all of the shows on the Next Real family of podcasts. Check it out and get reading. Support the show and build your reading list. It's a win-win. Head to thenextreel.com slash originals. <laughs> <laughs>